Good evening, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the Sports Exchange. My name is Scott Morgan Roth, the Motor City Mad Mouth, and we have a new era here on the Sports Exchange, at least you know, with Steve Ballesteri in the, uh, right across from me. Steve, welcome to the Sports Exchange, but now we get to do this, and I get to see a big guy from southwestern Florida. How you doing, big guy? Oh, I'm doing great, man. Thanks for inviting me, as always. And, yes, it is different because we're used to just talking to each other you know, where we can't see each other now, uh, you know, uh, I, I get to see the shrine behind you. This is just a mini shrine, Steve, let me tell you. <laughs> it is a mini shrine. But, you know, it's something that lets you know that uh, there's a history behind all this uh, crazy stuff I put you through week in and week out. So, but anyways, uh, glad to do it every week. And, and I'm thinking of other ways to get you involved. So stay by that phone if you, if you don't mind. Absolutely, man. I look forward to it every week. Oh, yeah. And who knows? I might even drag you into some other projects. How does that sound? <laughs> Always do. sounds like a plan to me. Oh, yeah. Well, so everybody now, you can see him, Steve Ballesteri. This is Scott Morgan Roth, the Motor City Band Mouth. We do this every week. We get you ready for uh, football. And when football season's over, as we'll take an old line out of Apollo Creed, oh, we'll think of something else. Don't worry. That's what we're going to do. Two KG vets talking sports tonight. It's football. With that said, Steve, why don't you let the audience know a lot about what you are about? Yeah, um, as we've said be on here before, uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Steve B Seven SFG. Uh, I write for uh, a pro football website covering the New England Patriots called PatsFans.com. I've been writing for them for over nine years now. Um, I also cover the military for a website called softrep.com. We write about politics, military affairs. We've talked about that uh, on one of your other shows. And, um, and uh, I do a podcast called Patriots 4th and 2. And uh, we talk about uh, the Pats and who they're playing and who, you know, who, who they played in, uh, the week before. But uh, now we get to talk a little bit about everybody. So I, I really look forward to this. Wow. And don't worry, I'll think of all the projects. When football's over, you and I got to be thinking plenty of stuff. But meanwhile, let's focus on something that I don't think I really like to talk about, but there's perception and reality. And that's a passing of Gail Sayers, who died at the age of 77. I heard it's from complications due to dementia. And everybody knows that not only did Gail Sayers have a brief uh, Hall of Fame career. He was also part of that movie with Brian Song with Brian Piccolo. Why don't you give us some of your uh, recollections of Gail Sayers, Steve? Yeah, you know, um, as a little, someone a little bit older than yourself, I, I grew up, I, I've actually saw Gail Sayers play. And, uh, you know, when it was live, and of course it was on television, I didn't see him in person, but he was like the first of those kind of guys that you could tell were just special when they were on the field. Right. And he was incredible. And, you know, as great as he was, everyone always goes back to that 1969, 65 game against the San Francisco 49ers. For, I mean, he had, I think it was nine carries for 113 yards and four touchdowns. Right. Two receptions for 89 yards and a touchdown and kickoff returns for another, I think it was a buck 34 mm -hmm. and a touchdown. I mean, six touchdowns in one game, 22 in his rookie season. That was just incredible. And that was in that era where guys didn't have that kind of production that you see today. Right. Yeah. I remember, uh, I do remember him well enough for, you know, following the Lions and the Bears. And I saw him play on TV a few times. And I don't know if he was in that game when the uh, Lions, Chuck Hughes, died on the field. I believe he might have been. But mm -hmm. nevertheless, he was an explosive player. And when you have to see him twice a year like we did with the Lions, you know, we never looked forward That's, to it. Yeah, that rivalry with Detroit. I mean, and those were special games, you know, when you have that – he, he played the, you know, the Lions, the Packers a couple of times a year, the Vikings. Those were special games back then. And, and growing up, you know, in the Boston area, I used to love that division growing up. It was just, it had that aura about it. That was like, 
the tough guys. You know, if you wanted to uh, be successful in the league, you know, that that was the, the division you wanted to be in. Well, you have the oldest rivalries in that division. I love Chris Berman of ESPN when he would call it the NFC Norris division. You know, I think that's a very good, accurate stereotype because, indeed, a lot of those teams, you know, are in the Midwest and they have played each other for a lot of years. I mean, I know the Vikings came later, but the rivalry between the Lions and the Packers and the Bears amongst those three teams, they go back a long, long, long time. And even today, these days, regardless of who's competitive and who isn't, you always like to see those rivalries every year. So, uh, Yeah, and it was such a shame to hear about him passing. I mean, I know he lived to be 77, which is pretty ripe old age. But uh, at the same time, uh, you know, I always think of Gail Sayers being 25. Yeah. You know, I think I think of him in that prime where he was still galloping out there on the field and right. those muddy fields where the, you know, the turf wasn't so great, but he still looked like he could fly, you know, even in those days. It's it's a shame, and uh, you know uh, we obviously send our condolences to the family, and and uh, it's sad to hear, especially that he had dementia. Uh, I didn't know that. Yeah, well, that's what I I had heard that, so I, I'm assuming that that unless I hear otherwise that dementia was the situation. But nevertheless, you know the guy played at Soldier Field when Soldier Field was Soldier Field. And of course, I we played at Tiger Stadium and Lambeau Field, and can't ask for three uh, more historic shrines. I mean, listen, the Lions played at Tiger Stadium for a lot of years before they made their way to the Silver Dome, and then subsequently over to Ford Field. With that said, let's talk about some of the games. We're going to talk about four that happened, and then we're going to talk about a bunch of other games this week. We'll start off with a team you're all too familiar with, and that's the New England Patriots, losing impressively. Kind of repeat an impressive loss to the Seattle Seahawks. Cam Newton looked awfully good. He did, and and against Russell Wilson, you talk about a matchup that deserved to be in prime time. This one lived up to its billing, didn't it, Steve? Oh man, uh, Russell Wilson looked like a magician out there. I mean, no matter what the Patriots did, and you know, uh, he threw for five touchdowns and only seven incompletions, and that's one of the best secondaries in the NFL. That's the strength of the New England Patriots is their secondary. And Wilson carved them up. But, you know, during the game, you would think, oh, well, they got no pressure on him. They had a lot of pressure on Wilson during the game. But he's just so good, you know, that he could slip here, slide there. And, you know, there was a couple of a couple of his long touchdown passes right. on Sunday night. He was hit just as he released the ball, but he got it off in time. They were always just that much short from getting home. But that's what makes him so special. And he had a tremendous game. And then on the flip side, I think Cam Newton, you know, uh, we still had a lot of questions going into Sunday night. You know, is Cam going to be able to get the passing offense going? We know he can run and he's healthy again. And we saw that in week one. But, you know, can he get this passing game going? And they don't have the greatest group of wide receivers. Right. But he threw for 397 yards. He brought them down to the one-yard line with three seconds to go. And the game could have actually – a game they really didn't deserve to win. I thought Seattle was the better team all night long. But Newton brought them back in the fourth quarter. And they came within one yard of pulling that game out and being 2-0 themselves. It was a great football game. If if you're a football fan, that's the kind of Sunday night game you want to watch. Oh, without a doubt. I mean, think about it. We're up to this point before New England signed him. We're talking Jared Stidham, Ryan yeah. Boyer. But yeah. I understand they were developing some and they were high. But when you can get a guy like Cam Newton pretty reasonably priced, uh, do you cheap think player. that – Yeah, cheap. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Which is what they did. Yeah, they, he's been getting paid a million bucks. That's it. But I'll tell you what, and I know we have 14 games to go in this season. He seems comfortable with not only Belichick, but McDaniels. I have a feeling that for some reason or another, if he's having a good time and they're winning, this is not a one-and-done, one-year-out deal. I have a gut feeling that Cam Newton would certainly love to stay there. And you talk about a guy going, you going from Tom Brady to Cam Newton, 
that worked out pretty well, at least <laughs> based on the early return, Steve. Right. Oh, yeah. It was, it's still very early. We're only two games in. But I think at this point, even like the the New England fans, and I was one of them, uh, I honestly didn't want to see Cam come to New England. I, I didn't think he'd be a fit here, and I was totally wrong there. I mean, you can see the offense is already clicking onto him. And, you know, um, the players all believe in him. Uh, that's the, the big thing, is they've already – really bought in with Newton as their leader. You can see it in the huddles. You can see it in the practices. It's just uh, that there's a confidence and there's a, uh, a tightness with the group already at this early stage. And it, it's something to see. But, you know, um, <clears throat> I was – honestly, I was concerned with his health. I, he's been banged up. He had the shoulder issues. He had the foot issue. I didn't know if if he'd be able to play uh, like he used to. And so far this year, he seems completely healthy. That was one of the things I took away from Sunday night. He put some zip on a couple of passes where you could tell that shoulder's healthy again. That pass to Julian Edelman, it was a 49-yard pass play. He threw it actually 56 yards in the air off his back foot, and he dropped it in a dime. It was a beautiful throw. And he, he had another one later in the game. Uh, it was either to Edelman or Nikhil Harry. It was a very tight window, and he threw right. the equivalent of a 95-mile-an-hour fastball in there. But uh, that was the, the questions we had. It was his health and w- whether or not he'd be a fit. And so far, uh, him and Belichick have this, uh, this relationship where it seems like he's been here a lot longer. Yeah, it doesn't seem that way. I mean, Julian Edelman, too, seems to be the primary uh, benefactor of his play. And when you talk about the fact that Cam Newton has played two solid games with no preseason with a brand-new team, I think that makes this even more interesting and dynamic that he's able to succeed early. Can you only imagine if he gets four games under his belt, how much better, Steve, that he's going to get as the year goes on? Right. Well, that's that's the goal, obviously. And they're, they're very, uh, obviously, the Patriots coaches are very, very happy with how fast he's progressed in, you know, mastering the offense. And there's still some times where maybe uh, he's not audibling where he should, at, you know, in the time frame that they want. And that's going to come with time. As you said, I mean, there was no preseason. He signed here at the end of June. So there was no, you know, There was no OTAs, no mini camp. And with the abbreviated training camp, again, I was thinking Jared Stidham was going to be your starter on week one. And uh, Newton has played much, much better, faster than we thought he would. Um, But again, but going back to Sunday night, Russell Wilson was just absolutely fantastic. I thought he was the difference in the game. Um, No matter what they tried to do, he, he was bettering them and other than that uh that one play call at the end where Pete Carroll instead of going for a third and one with a running play right. they tried to right. deep bomb which had worked all game long but I you know I thought they would run the ball because they averaged uh, over five yards a carry and they were even if you don't make it you force the Patriots to burn them another time out uh I thought that kind of opened the door for Cam to come back, and and they did. They came within a yard of uh, pulling that game out. But, yeah, what a great game. Offense is obviously ruled in that one. Yeah, well, all the only thing I can say is you had a game there with uh, a heavyweight fight. Counter punching is what you saw, and you got to see it in prime time, a heavyweight fight, and that was really good. We'll talk about one game now that looked like a bantamweight fight and that's the Detroit Lions getting hammered by the Green Bay Packers now I, I wanted to text you on Sunday because I told you that there that Green Bay was going to put a 40 spot on Detroit I think I said 41 14 41 17 but I'm going to pat myself on the back for this because it was 42 to 21 so I was still was in the 40s I don't care about a late touchdown later but the Lions got it handed to them Again, becoming the uh, – now they've lost four straight double-digit games, yet another infamous NFL record. 
And Matt Patricia's seat is getting hotter by the second, and it's not going to get any easier. You've got the Cardinals, which we're going to get to in a little bit, and we're going to, and then they get New Orleans. But when we took take a look at the Lions and Green Bay Packers game, what did you get out of that football game? Well, I didn't watch it live, but I, I watched some of the tape afterwards on the uh, NFL Game Pass and uh, the All Twenty Two and. Uh, I thought Aaron Rodgers kind of ripped that. And we talked about that last week. You know, we kind of had that feeling Rodgers was going to rip them. And, you know, they had the running game going. They had, I, was it a 75-yard touchdown run? Yeah, 12 seconds into the second half, yeah. 75 yes. yards. And the, the 75, thing, yeah. The thing that didn't help the Lions cause is they continue to be undisciplined, Steve and commit penalties at the wrong times. That appears to be the one thing that Matt Patricia should know better. Why this team is undisciplined, Steve, to me, is beyond my wildest of imagination. You worked with Patricia back up in New England. Were his defenses, Steve, in New England undisciplined, or were they more disciplined than they were now? Oh, they, they were much more disciplined up here. I mean, the Patriots are always one of the least penalized teams right. in the NFL. And, and Belichick is always a stickler for the rules. And, you know, that's one of the things they do in training camp. When, when the rules get tweaked, they practice using that exact tweak so that they don't fall into that during games. And, of course, they bring the officials in, and Belichick would ask them to call it really tight so the players get used to that. In fact, one, in a, one year when there was there was a lot of talk about uh, defensive backs, you know, grabbing and holding on too much. Mm -hmm. Belichick and Patricia made the defensive backs wear boxing clothes. Really? In oh. practice. Wow. So they couldn't grab on to the, to the wide receivers. And I remember watching it that day, and I was just uh, – I thought it was – actually, I thought it was kind of brilliant, okay, because, you know, here's – you know, obviously there was a lot of complaining with the league. Guys were grabbing too much, and then they were going to start calling it. Well, one way to get your players to stop doing that is making it where they have to get used to not playing, where they can grab onto it. Now, obviously, in the game, you can get away with a little bit. But wearing boxing gloves in practice, you're not going to grab anybody. True. And, you know, uh, that's one of the surprising things because, you know, you can talk about talent. You can talk about, you know, uh, schemes or whatever. But, you know, one of the things that, they prided themselves on under Matt Patricia was not getting penalized. And that seems to be like a huge problem with the Lions. Doesn't it? And you know, that boxing glove analogy that you brought up reminds me of Rocky punching meats as he got ready for <laughs> yeah. Apollo Creed. You want to talk about uncharacteristic. That definitely is uncharacteristic. So, but so let's go back to the Packers and the Lions again. Matt Stafford, they get off to a nice start, you know, but the penalties undo them, that 75-yard run, and then all of a sudden the wheels came off for the Lions, and it would turn out to be another long afternoon up in Lambeau. Yeah, and again, I mean, it's like, you know, I saw a lot of criticism of Stafford after the game, and I'm thinking to myself, this guy has been playing behind the eight ball for his entire career. It yeah. seems like he's always playing from behind. He always has to do, you know, what would be a big comeback it seems like every week you know uh it has to be wearing on him mentally yeah. because again you know that game i i was watching some of the tape and it, i mean this happens far too often for this kid i think he's a really really good quarterback i think he's just in a bad situation i agree totally agree i mean Anybody that, to me, criticizes Matt Stafford will get my wrath because let me say something. You talk about a kid. I love his uh, the way he throws the ball. There are times when he'll throw sidearm if he needs a different arm angle or he can go deep, whatever way he has. And you know what? When you have a poor offensive line, you don't have a running game, and you're expected to do it all by yourself, what do you expect? I mean, so I think anywhere but there, Matthew Stafford would get the respect that he deserves. But not in Detroit. But, you know, you know, Green Bay, obviously, they've beaten the Vikings and the Lions. Both teams are 0-2. 
we'll obviously though we'll get to their game later on in the broadcast. But again, the Detroit Lions continue to waste a good a good effort by Stafford. And you know when you come out firing against the Packers, they look good, but they just can't close it. And these problems continue to mount week in and week out. Yeah, and and we talked about it even before the season. You know, the, we thought the offense was going to be good, right. but there was a lot of questions on that defense, and they haven't answered them yet. And I think you're absolutely correct. I think Matt Patricia's seat. It's not even hot anymore. I think he's on fire down there, oh, yeah. you know, because uh, the way they're going, you have a couple of really tough games. And as you said, we'll talk about that. But, I mean, if they start off 0-4, he might be out of a job. Yeah, anybody that wants to sit here and say that Kenny Galladay not being in there as a part of their 0-2 mark, I think that is the biggest cop out on the planet because the Lions didn't need him in game one against the Bears, they were so close to winning that game. There's no excuse to give up 21 unanswered points at the end. And the, and the penalties that took place against Green Bay, Steve, and then a 75-yard 75 75 run, 12 seconds. I, I don't buy it. Don't get me wrong. Galladay is certainly a great receiver. His numbers are what they are. But I am not blaming Kenny Galladay being out of the lineup as a, as a reason why the Lions are 0-2. The Lions have a lot of problems. We've talked about this before, about the bend but not break situation, but they're breaking, and they're breaking badly. So Yeah, I mean, Galladay being in there isn't going to make the other team score 42 points. Precisely my point. Yeah. yeah. Well, when I came up with that 40 spot, I was thinking about you on <laughs> Sunday. I, know. I was feeling bad on Sunday. I was uh, – I was I was watching uh, another game at the time, and uh, I kept seeing that score roll over, roll over. And uh, I was thinking about you at the same time because I was yeah. like, well, you, I know one person down here in South Florida that's not happy. Wow, well, I'm worried about it. Hey, you know what? If I'm not happy, it's one thing. But if I'm getting it right and I sound pretty – intelligent on our broadcast, I can handle that a little bit. So I'll go ahead and take that thing called a moral victory. After all, we gave your Patriots an impressive loss at the outset of the broadcast. So. Yeah, the Bill Belichick doesn't believe in moral victories. But at the same time, I think they came away feeling pretty good about where they're heading. Yeah, yeah so too. I, I think that uh, you are so right. So in Cam we trust? I don't know. Yeah. I don't know, but so far he's he's looking really, really good. Yeah, he is. All right, let's go on to the third game. Uh, Tampa Bay 31-17 over Carolina. Tom Brady finally looked a little bit better, all that smoke screen about his first game. And then Leonard Fournette, I believe, rushed for over 100 yards, getting acclimated into the offense. We know Tampa's going to be pretty good anyways. I think that thing called overreaction, a.k.a. Bruce Arians, okay, Leave it alone, folks. The Tampa Bay Bucks will be fine, and I'm glad to see Tom Brady get that win. You know, it's not. I don't care what everybody says about the guy being 43 years of age. If he wasn't in decent shape, I don't think he'd be able to survive at all. So, what are your thoughts about the Buccaneers and the uh, Panthers? Yeah, I watched that game, and uh, I thought uh, the Bucks came out really strong in the first half. I thought their offense looked really, really sharp. Um, Brady hit on a nice touchdown pass to Mike Evans. Um, you know, they, they had it going on. It seemed like the offense slowed down in the second half, but late in the game, Fournette took it over as he's apt to do. And, uh, I thought it was a good game. I, I, Carolina, uh, tried to come back, but it seemed like Teddy Bridgewater was like, they, he was like right on the cusp of bringing them back. It seemed like making a ball game, but it, he couldn't get it done. I just thought it was a good win for Tampa. Uh, Arians has obviously got to be happy. But the offense looked a lot better. And now with Fournette, they can run the football against anybody. Yeah. And that's going to open up things in the passing game. And as Brady finds that comfort level more and more with guys like Evans, I think that offense will get even better. The one thing I'm curious is they have so many good tight ends. They have Cameron Brate, they have O.J. Howard, Rob Gronkowski. Right. Although I think Gronk's starting to show his age. Hey. You know, 
that was a staple with Tom Brady in New England was using the tight ends. And that's not a big part of Arians' offense. Uh, with those guys, I'm curious to see if Arians gets them more involved down, you know, as the season progresses, because they have really good tight ends on that team. And it would be criminal to waste that kind of talent. Well, I believe Chris Godwin was out of that game, wasn't he, Steve? I, believe it was a- um, I think he left the game. I, I don't know if he played a – I'll have to go back and double check. Well, I, I, I believe he was – I don't, He might not have played. Uh, I don't think he did. But a guy that got hurt for Carolina was Christian McCaffrey. And mm. you know, he's definitely – I've uh, been a work. I think he's going to be out for a little bit of a time with an ankle injury too. Yeah, they're they're talking a couple of weeks minimum. So, and that's a shame because that kid is such a tremendous football player. It was a horrible week for injuries uh, on Sunday. I mean, Christian McCaffrey goes down. Um, you know, the Forty Nine lost a lot of people in the Meadowlands, and they 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 were complaining late uh, later on after the game about the. The condition of the field. Jimmy Garoppolo goes down. Uh, Bosa goes down. Uh, Moser had run for an 80 yard touchdown on the first play of the game, and then he goes down. I mean, Solomon Thomas went down. I mean, they'd lost so many players, and they're already short. They had a, a bunch of injuries to begin with. Now they're going to be hurting. So it's going to be interesting to see, especially in that division, if they can keep pace. I think they're playing the Giants this week over at the Meadowlands too, aren't they? So uh, they didn't have to leave their hotel; they get to hang out over in the New York Greater Meadowlands. Yeah. yeah, they went. To, they only went as far as West Virginia, uh, that resort where every, all the uh, the Saints go, I believe, uh, for training camp uh, up in West Virginia. That's where they went for the week, and they practiced there. And they're they're going to go back to the Meadowlands on Sunday. All right. Well, they got it all. Well, they obviously. Whoever was planning their travel itinerary knew pretty well that they get to go to the Big Apple a uh, couple of games in a row. But, hey, West Virginia is not a bad place to work out at all. All right, let's go on to another game at SoFi Stadium, the opener for the L.A. Chargers. Kansas City Chiefs 23-20 over the Chargers. I was hoping the Chargers would win. Uh, they brought in Justin Herbert when Tyrod Taylor could not play due to a, I think, a chest injury from out here. Didn't the team doctor do something? Uh, yeah. I was shocked when I read that today. The team doctor was giving him an injection because I guess he had cracked some ribs. Right. And he actually punctured his lung. Mm. And they had to take him to the hospital. And, uh, I mean, that's just horrible. Uh, when I read that today, I was like, wow. Because Tyrod Taylor, is, he's had kind of a rough go of it. I mean, everywhere he goes, they bring in a, another quarterback. Right. And then uh, on Sunday, now I know that they said that he's their quarterback moving forward. I think it's going to be hard to keep that Herbert kid on the bench. Yeah, he, looked- he looked pretty good on Sunday. I'm not saying he was uh, great, but I thought he looked pretty good for a kid who didn't even know he was going to start come in cold first NFL game against the Super Bowl champs. I think uh, if you're the Chargers, you have to really like what you saw. Well, Justin Herbert was selected, Steve, sixth overall. And I know Oregon quarterbacks generally struggle, but this kid here, his upside is unbelievable for sure. I mean, if it wasn't for that, I, that one mistake he made. They were driving the ball down the field. He had an easy first down if he runs. And he tried to force the ball back across his body and it got picked off. But that kind of opened the door for the Chiefs to come back and eventually win the game. I thought if he runs the ball there, and it's easy to say that watching from the couch, but, uh, you know, and he's a rookie. He'll learn from his mistakes. But if he runs the ball, they get a first down there, they might score and win that football game. Yeah, but the turning point in this game, I thought that they should have gone for it on fourth and one. Don't you yep. put that ball back into Patrick Mahomes' hands? Because if you do that, you're asking for trouble. And indeed, that became the case. Yeah, that yeah. Game. Yeah, because I was on uh, Twitter with some friends of mine during that game, oh, yeah. and we were, t- yeah, tweeting, tweeting back and forth. And as soon as they went for the field goal, instead of the fourth and one, I was like. That's a ball game. Kansas City's going to win now. Yeah, I felt and, it. Uh, yeah, because Mahomes is like, you know, the, and I thought the Chargers did a really good job on him through about three quarters. 
they kept him in check and you know and but it it happens so fast and that offense got such speed that you kind of seen it coming and they had that one little crack and that's why they won the Super Bowl last year. That that offense got so much speed. Uh, they're fun to watch. Uh, although I'm not a Chiefs fan, uh, they're just fun to watch when there's no skin in the game. You know, you watch them because it's those guys can just turn and burn. Well, let's focus our attention to Thursday night. Uh, I've seen this matchup a few times over the last few years. And then tomorrow night I won't be up in Jacksonville because I'll be here. Uh, the Miami Dolphins travel up I-95 to take on the Jacksonville Jaguars. You have Ryan Fitzpatrick with the big full-fledged beard against Gardner Minshew <laughs> with the Mustang. So, but, but meanwhile, the Jaguars had uh, lost a tough game up in Tennessee, 33-30, while the Miami Dolphins obviously – Uh, Lost to a very good Buffalo Bills team with Josh Allen, who I think will ultimately be one of the best quarterbacks in this division, if not in the league. So what do you expect for the Miami Dolphins and the Jacksonville Jaguars? Miami enters this game 0-2, and and Jacksonville is a good 1-1. Yeah, um, you know, a lot of people thought Jacksonville was going to be awful this year, and they're turning people's heads right now. They're playing good football. Um, And that game with Tennessee, that could have easily went their way. Oh, yeah. That that was a really good football game. Um, You know, it's going to be interesting because this is the kind of game where, you know, with Fitzpatrick, he could come into this game and just be completely awful. You know, that we've talked about this. He's so streaky. Or he could come in and just tear them up on national television. Right. You know, and uh, I kind of have the feeling we're going to see the good Fitzy on Thursday night. Yeah, I thought he played well uh, against a really good Buffalo defense. Yeah. You know, they, they actually came back and, you know, it looked like they could ha- have a good chance of winning that game. And, uh, you know, that, that Buffalo defense is really, really good. I thought Fitzpatrick played well. I thought Miami played well. I, You know, again, there's no moral victories. Right. But, uh, the way they came away from that game, I, I think they had to be a little bit – and more encouraged than they were after week one. I thought they didn't play with any kind of, you know, uh, and again, it's the first game of the year, but when they went to Foxborough, they didn't play with that emotion. They, they kind of looked like they were going through the motions a little bit and uh, they didn't look that way against Buffalo. I thought they looked much better. I'm looking forward. You know, when I saw this on the schedule earlier before the season started, I was like, I might not even watch this one. Now I'm kind of looking forward to it where I think it's going to be an exciting game. Yeah, I think it'll be intriguing. I agree with you. Everybody was talking about tanking for Trevor. Well, everybody said tanking for two, and the Dolphins got him anyways. But, you know, Doug Marone and Dave Caldwell are under a lot of pressure. Now, the one way they can stay out the hot seat is if you have a very competitive five- or six-win team with younger players, that buys those guys another year. And if Gardner Minshew makes the progress, but he hasn't looked that badly. He really hasn't. So I think that this Thursday game might be more entertaining than most people think. I really do. Yeah, well, and I felt the same way last Thursday, and it turned out to be a great football game as well. So I think this one's going to be a good one. They're, they're in-state rivals, and uh, I, I think it's going to be a, a really fun game to watch. I look for a lot of scoring in this one. Yeah, I'll be seeing it after I get done with my pair of broadcasts tomorrow night. But uh, yeah, <laughs> but no, it's okay. I'll, I'll I'll send you some text messages. Keep you informed what's going. Please on. do. I would appreciate it. <laughs> well, you never know. I might drag you out of there and make you do a fantasy football broadcast tomorrow. You never know. <laughs> That's the one thing I. You know, I, I've never done fantasy football. No. Uh, I, every year, my friends always try to get me in this league or that league. It's just one of those things that's never really been of interest to me. And guys always send me tweets and they were like, who should I draft on my fantasy team? I was like, You're talking to the wrong guy because hey, I don't what follow I, it. What I, I, don't, I don't know how it all works. It's what just, if I ever brought you on there just to evaluate players? Would you ever be intrigued if for no other reason to evaluate players? Yeah, well, 
Just we'll kidding. have to check that out. But uh, no, I'm just kidding with you. I'm just giving you a hard time. I only got involved with fantasy football myself, Steve, because I have a uh, family up in Wisconsin that needed an extra player, and I did. Uh, otherwise, <laughs> to me, I don't miss doing it this year, but I feel I have to have the show on because there's an audience for it, which is why I do have it on our what, what, what we do. Just giving you a hard time. I like what we do here anyways, talking plain old football, which is what we do. So that's good stuff. But I had to pick an old uh, guy on uh, my level's uh, brain about fantasy football anyways. <laughs> Yeah, that's one thing. I, I don't know how it all scores and works. and um, It's just never been a big interest to me, so I've never gotten involved. In well, we're old school journalists. What do you expect? I don't mean old school because of the gray hair, but we're our old school journalists that are used to real football and know the inner workings out of it, which is why I think guys like you and me can take it or leave it. So I'm totally with you. But, yeah, it'll be definitely – but I'm looking forward to the Dolphins and the Jaguars – game and I'll see it after our fantasy but I'll look for those checks if you if you are not in the pool and you care to do so but I will not yeah. the pool's right behind me but uh I'll be inside tomorrow watching the game well okay well let's talk about the team we just, I just got done talking about earlier the Detroit Lions are going uh to State Farm Stadium University of Phoenix Stadium whatever you want to call it I actually took a tour of that stadium to take on the Cardinals and boy if you thought that game with the Packers and the Lions is ugly, this one's going to get worse. Yeah, because uh, Kyle Murray has that speed where if your defense loses containment, this game could get ugly really, really quickly. Yeah. Because he can make it happen with his feet, with his arm. I think he's off to a great start this year. Um, and, again, we talked about the Lions' defense – can they stop a guy like Kyla Murray? I don't think so. So the, I, I, I think now the Cardinals defense, I'm, I'm not overly impressed with those uh, guys. I, I think Detroit will be able to move the football. I think they'll be able to score. The big question, obviously, as it comes down to for Matt Stafford all the time, can he score enough to keep up? Well, the question is, is the Lions defense couldn't stop marginal receivers in Green Bay. What do you think that DeAndre Hopkins and Larry Fitzgerald are going to do to them? Yeah. You want to talk Nuke. about <laughs> Yeah, uh, between Kyle Murray and Nuke and uh, Larry Fitzgerald still productive. and uh, He is. <clears throat> you know, it's going to be – I think it's going to get ugly for the Lions again. I'm sorry to tell you this, but that's just my two cents. Oh, I'm already prepared for it. I'm, I'll tell you right now, I think that if I thought the 42-20 – one score was bad. I'm expecting the Cardinals to put up 48, 50 points on this Lions team. Uh, I, I, that's just my gut feeling because you know what? Kyler Murray, Steve, the way he plays, it makes a, he makes this game look like a video game is what he does. He makes it look like a Madden game where he can just run all over the field and do whatever he wants. And if you give him a halfway decent running attack with Kenyon Drake and a few of those other running backs, yeah, it's going to get ugly. I mean, the uglier it gets, I think a lot of people in Detroit say, yeah, let them get whipped. That, that means Patricia will be out the door that much quicker. Yeah. But, again, I think the Cardinals are going to score 45-plus points, and they're going to blow the Lions out of the building. I mean, uh, you know, you're right. Uh, they can't get in and track me with anybody. They can't stop anybody, let alone get in and track me with any. And, and you know, that air raid offense that – Cliff Kingsbury, everybody doubted coming out of college, hasn't worked out too badly, and you surround him right, right quarterback. So, you want to give me a score that you think would be? Uh, yeah, I'm. I'm. I'm not going to go quite that high. I was going to go 38 to uh, 27. Really? People in Detroit are going to like you better than me. <laughs> yeah, I like. I said, I think they can score on you know, on the Cardinals, and I think they will. It's just, you know, it's going to be hard because they're they're going to be sitting on the bench for a lot of this game. I don't see a lot of three and outs for the Cardinals in this one. Oh, no, you really don't. Yeah, no, I think 45 to 50 points is what you're looking at for the Cardinals. The Lions, if they score 20, more power to them. But it's, again, if they even get to 20, it'll be because Kenny Galladay's playing and Matthew Stafford is hitting on all cylinders. Because, you know, they do have Marvin Jones Jr. 
uh, as one of the wideouts. And then as long as Adrian Peterson is productive, Kerryon Johnson can stay. You know, Kerryon Johnson is a factor in DeAndre Swift, who I think uh, can be a good player, but it's still going to get ugly for the Lions in the depth. Yeah, and speaking of um, Marvin Jones, yeah, there's a lot of rumors uh, going around through New England circles that the Lions and the Patriots are talking about moving him. Do you think Detroit would let him go? Oh, that wouldn't surprise me. Yeah, the Lions have been known to make major trades, and it seems like the track record that these two teams have trading with each other would not surprise me. Yeah, because I, I know, well, uh, you know, the front office and, and the coaches, they obviously have a lot of, you know, bleed over there from New England. But right. I just I, – I wouldn't think that they would allow a, a player like him to leave. Well, that could be fun. No, I, I, here's, a, here's what – I'm thinking at a time when Matt, Patricia, and Bob Quinn, their job is on the line, I don't think it would be a wise idea if you're looking to stay employed, to stay competitive this year, to let go of Marvin Jones. But then again, we're talking to Detroit Lions, where you continue to let good players go midseason or after the season. And the sign of a bad culture, to me, is when you continue to let good players leave, especially when they're playing awfully well. And again, don't get me wrong, the Lions have only won one playoff game since 1957, and the last time they won a championship was on my birthday, December 29th, 1957, when I wasn't even alive. <laughs> we didn't do it any way you want, Steve. But to answer your question, it wouldn't surprise me, but it, I don't think it will happen this year because I know that Bob Quinn and Matt Patricia are really, really on the hot seat. And I'll go back to what you said, lose to the Cardinals and lose to the Saints. You go into a bye week, 0-4, you play Jacksonville. What, what can happen, depending on how bad those next couple of losses are, I, I've seen crazier things. And then you wonder, do you fire the coach four games into it, and you're giving a guy like maybe Daryl Bevel an audition to try to get that job? I mean, I'm throwing the name out there, and you have a 12 – games to be able to prove it. I don't think it gets to that far. I think the Fords are going to let them finish out the year and then clean house later. But that, I think this is something we'll definitely monitor for sure. But when you talk about the bend but not break situation and the Lions are breaking and they're breaking badly, I don't know. Have I answered your question? Yes, you did. <laughs> That's excellent. And, you know, and it's a tough division. I mean, you know, they uh, – they play the Vikings. Who I think the Vikings are definitely underwhelming this year. But, you know, we expected them to be a lot better. They play the Packers, you know, and uh, they play the Bears twice. And those games, uh, those divisional games are tough. So. Yeah. But they let Stefan Diggs get away, which I thought was a horrible trade. You take away one of Kirk Cousins' better targets, Stefan Diggs, and then you stick him in Buffalo with Josh Allen. And what do you have there? One guy that lost a good target, another one who's benefiting by it. And Absolutely. You draw the line and connect the dots. So. All right, so we talked about the Green Bay Packers, another uh, evening contest. They get the New Orleans Saints. What are your, what's your take on this one, Steve? That's going to be a great football game, isn't it? I, I'm, this one and Monday night are, are two games I'm really looking forward to watching. Um, you know, I'm a little uh, – and again, it's it's early. It's only week two, but Drew Brees hasn't looked like himself. And uh, you know, we always expect him to be on top of his game, and the you know the Saints to be kind of like that that juggernaut offensively that we've seen. Uh, but I think this is going to be a really good football game. Um, you know, I think both Brees and Rogers are going to be up for it because it's you know playing against each other. I, I look for a lot of fireworks in that one as well. It, again, it, you know, it'll come down to who can get a stop, I think, in the fourth quarter. Right. Well, not only that, Michael Thomas, I believe, is out for the New Orleans Saints. That's not going to help Drew Brees. No. So I think that if the Saints are going to generate offense, I think Alvin Kamara has to come up big in this game. I really do. And I, So this is a primetime game that keeps where you'll be out of the pool by then, right? Yeah, <laughs> I'll be definitely out of the pool by then. 
Yeah, I'll tell you what, though. The Green Bay Packers can get off to a 3-0 and start with all the conversation they had about drafting Jordan Love and Rodgers and the lack of targets. This could get pretty interesting. Yep. Uh, you know, and what better way to light a fire under your quarterback than to draft another one? Yeah. You know, there was a lot of talk that Rodgers was – you know, at the end of last year, well, he, he had slipped a little bit. and He was starting to show his age. And then, you know, everyone was saying, well, you know, uh, if they draft some talent on wide receiver, they're going to be just fine. And then they don't draft a wide receiver. They draft a quarterback. I can't think of anything that would fire up Rodgers more than that. Good point. But the thing that people have to understand is Rodgers has been hurt a little bit the last couple of years. So you need to have a reliable backup signal caller as well. So for those individuals, I mean, let's say they had Brett Hundley for a while, and we all know how that worked out, not very good, and they haven't been able to get the backup quarterback straight. So to be able to mold a young guy like they have done with, like they're doing with uh, Jordan Love, is a wise move, but we all know that's Rodgers' job to lose. Anybody that's going to sit here and tell you otherwise. Should they have drafted wide receivers? Yeah, but sometimes you can draft wide receivers higher in the draft, and they don't pan out either. So you might as well try to develop what you have. Perhaps a veteran comes uh, your way along the waiver wires. You know how that works, and you never know where you're going to find somebody that fits in. Devin Funches was supposed to be a guy that would be a weapon, but because of COVID-19, he decided not to play, as did a lot of guys. So, But I'll tell you what, if the Packers can pull out a win on – Against the Saints, you have a signature victory there. Would you want to offer a prediction on this one? I, I'm going to go with the Saints in this one. I just have a kind of feeling the Saints are going to um, pull this one out. I'm going to go 28-27. Yeah, and, you know, just to have fun with it, I'll go with the Packers 31-28. to And we'll address it next week, see who's right. There you go. <laughs> For a game that's probably wide open, that could really go either way. All right, let's go on to the Dallas Cowboys and the Seattle Seahawks on Sunday night. Yeah, this is another one. Uh, it should be a good football game. As we talked about Russell Wilson earlier, he's just, I mean, he's playing out of this world right now. I expect him to continue that. The Cowboys, you know, they have uh, – there's always talk around Dallas if they're, you know, they're going to make the big push. It'll be interesting to see if Mike McCarthy can get them guys over the hump. Right. The, the one thing I always worry about with Dallas is the meddling from the owner. You know, you hire football guys to coach football, just stay out of it. And, you know, at the first sign of, you know, kind of trouble, Jerry Jones kind of injects himself. So it'll be interesting to see this year how that works out. They haven't been able to come to any kind of agreement with Dak Prescott. But uh, this is, should be an exciting game. Um, you know, the uh, Seahawks defense can be can be taken advantage of. And, you know, their secondary is banged up right now. So that'll bear some watching. But uh, with Russell Wilson, Boy, this I think this hasn't the uh, you know the capability of being another big shootout. Yeah, yeah in fact, uh, I should point out the Packers New Orleans game. Saints game is the uh, one that's late at night, and the Cowboys Seattle game is at four twenty-five. Either way, it's a late afternoon it's yeah. a late game. Uh, but I think the Cowboys were lucky that they ended up beating the Atlanta Falcons for thirty-nine. <laughs> they were they were a uh, onside kick away from losing that and. You talk about a collapse, Atlanta did exactly that. So the Cowboys are this close to being 0-2. They really were. And Russell Wilson, to me, you're right, Steve. This guy here, to me, is unstoppable. I think that the – I actually think that Seattle will blow out Dallas. I really do. I think that the Cowboys were fortunate to get a win against Atlanta. And when I look at what Seattle did to New England – this is a making story double digit win for the Seahawks for sure. Yeah, I got this one 31 20 Seattle. All right, well, then you're going double digits too. So yeah. I'm probably not that far off. I could, it could be 34 20, but 
I still see double digits regardless. All right, let's talk about your Patriots again, but this time the Las Vegas Raiders. Yeah, it's going to take a while to get used to that, isn't it? Yeah, well, yeah, but <laughs> what a beautiful cool. stadium that place is, though. Yeah, they, yeah, well, that's funny. The Las Vegas Raiders who upset the Saints in Sin City get to go to New England to take down the Patriots and Cam Newton. Pretty interesting contest, I might add. Yeah, and, you know, they have a lot of weapons. I mean, they, um, you know, when I look at the Raiders, they, they don't have a lot of fantastic wide receivers, but they have a lot of good ones. I thought Zay Jones made a really nice catch in that game against the Saints for a touchdown. Mm-hmm. Uh, Tyrell Williams. Um, then they have Renfro, their kind of Julian Edelman type of slot receiver. Oh, don't forget. But the guy I love is that, that rookie Henry Ruggs. Henry Ruggs. I, watched, I watched. saw this play for Alabama against Michigan. Don't sell this kid short. Don't. Derek Carr gets him the football. This kid's going to be dangerous. So you're right. They've got some pretty good weapons. And I know that you've been around in the league long enough that Mike Mayock is a heck of a football mind and with John Gruden. And I, I had a chance to meet Mayock. I think we talked about this uh, on a broadcast about the camera one if I might add, and he was one that I think I stuck in that list. And you know what? Henry Ruggs is going to be a pretty good player, whether you know anything about fantasy football or not. For those fantasy people that are looking for a a guy, hopefully later in the year, as he starts to get more and more developed and sees time. Yeah, I I see them using him like the Chiefs use Tyreek Hill. I think they're going to move him into the slot. They're going to try to stretch the field with him. And, I mean, he ran the second fastest 40 in in NFL combine history. The guy can flat out fly. I loved watching him in Alabama because he's just electric when they get the ball in his hand. And, you know, he started off a little slow, but, I mean, he's a rookie. And, and again, we were, as we said earlier, right? no preseason. I mean, you know, uh, workouts were cut way back. I think the kid's destined for big things in the NFL – it's going to be interesting to see how the Patriots try to match up with him. Um, and, you know, their tight end, Waller, had a tremendous game on Monday night. So, you know, I look for those guys. But, you know, and when they faced Derek Carr a few times. And Belichick's been able to scheme up some really good defense. And he's able to uh, – both times they've faced Derek Carr, they've held him under 10 points. Have they really? That, that's what gives me a little bit of uh, optimism going in. I know – the Patriots secondary got roasted on uh, Sunday night and up in Seattle, but I just kind of have that feeling that they'll be able to confuse Derek Carr a little bit. Um, and again, with Cam Newton, it seems like he's finding his feet. I think the Raiders are going to have a tough time stopping him. No question. In fact, don't Denver Jerry, uh, Jerry Judy was Henry Ruggs' running wide wide receiver uh, compliment. So. And, and I'll tell you what, when Candy and I saw them with the Wolverines and that tied, those are some good players. So, yeah, I, I I agree with you, Steve. I can actually see the Patriots winning this game 27 to 17. Yeah, I, I'm about this, in the same boat with you there. I think, uh, you know, we'll, we'll probably be in the mid 20s there. And I think the defense will play better this week. Should be a really good football game. The Raiders are, you know, I, they're. They're definitely trending up. As you said, Mayock and Gruden are building a really good football team there. They have a lot of young guys, and a lot of young guys are thrust in, you know, starting roles. But I think they're only going to get better. Yeah, I agree. And we might as well uh, end the program with talking about the Kansas City Chiefs and the Baltimore Ravens. My oh, man, that's going to be a good football game. Yeah. You're talking about a highlight film game right oh, there. Yeah. You know, uh, the two young quarterbacks that are just lighting it up right now, Lamar Jackson, Pat Mahomes. Um, I think the Ravens have a little bit better of a defense. But uh, at the same time, I think Mahomes can light it up on anybody. It's going to be interesting to see if the Chiefs can stop Lamar Jackson when he runs. Because uh, when he gets that running game going, that they just start rolling downhill and it like you can't stop them. So 
I think this is going to be another high scoring game. I have this one 38 35. Yeah, well, you know what? I, I've got you 41 35, but I'm right. <laughs> Great minds think alike. Yeah, we do. Hey, well, I mean, come on. I mean, Patrick Mahomes got a new contract, right? Lamar Jackson's going to get one. And you got two guys that are, to me, I mean, they could see each other probably uh, during the uh, AFC championship game. So, and all roads lead to both of these two teams. I mean, I believe Lamar Jackson's a local kid here in Palm Beach County. I think he played at Boynton Beach High School. So, but, and you got a great Monday night game. You know, you talk about some good primetime matchups. This one here, and we we saw the one, obviously, at last Sunday night when you had the um, Seahawks. What The Seahawks win over uh, the Patriots, yeah. Uh, Patriots, so. Some of these prime prime time matchups, Steve, are looking awfully good. So yeah, I think th- this is going to be an exciting week to watch. And if you like scoring uh, in the NFL, I think you're going to be really happy this week. So, what are your thoughts about John Gruden and Sean Payton getting fined? What was it? Uh, I think it was a hundred k for not wearing yeah. pants. Yeah, um, you know the league said they were they were serious about that and. You know, um, it's not pennies there. I mean, that's that's a pretty hefty fine. So, um, and then the teams got fined. I think two hundred thousand grand. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, they showed they were serious about it. Uh, the, they were obviously, you know, I I didn't actually catch that Gruden didn't have his mask on. I noticed Sean Payton did. So I I thought it was a little, you know, interesting. He wasn't wearing it, but. Uh, I didn't think anything of it until we heard about that. I think the league is showing that they're serious about they want to keep the, the level of this, you know, virus down because they don't want to lose any games this year. And I, I think if somebody doesn't do it go, moving forward, they're going to get fined even more. Oh, yeah. Well, never, uh, I don't know how much you're paying attention to college football, but a lot of games are getting canceled. Yeah. I know the Big Ten – in Pac-12, we're talking about restarting, and the SEC is getting going. But, you know, in fact, the game I was supposed to cover on Saturday, F- uh, USF against FAU has been postponed. I don't know if they'll ultimately schedule it later in the year. I have to figure it out down the road with these two. But the college games, they're dropping like flies. They really are. I, don't, I still wonder how they're going to pull it off uh, and be able to legitimize it. But that's for another day. But I don't know. I mean, and I hear that, that both – well, I know Peyton had COVID and – um, Gruden did, so these guys ought to know better. They, yeah. So I, I, I don't know if you know this or not, So, but when someone gets fined, who really pays that fine? Does it actually come out of the coach's pocket or the owner is going to look the other way and write the check anyways? <laughs> well, supposedly it comes out of the, um, the coach's paycheck and goes to the league. Does that's it? what they say. I don't know. That's a good question. Though. Speaking of coaches, did you- <laughs> did you see Bill? Did you see Bill Belichick this morning? No, I didn't. He he came out and he looked like he looked like he had been up for like forty eight hours. His hair was all messed up. He was wearing a ratty old sweatshirt. I mean, he usually has the one with the sleeves cut off, mm-hmm. but this one was all worn where it had big holes around the neck, and it looked like he had been on a bender for like three or four days. Wow, and. Uh, I, you know, when I saw that, I immediately cracked up laughing. And then I said, that is a, that's not, it's not a coincidence. I thought that was on purpose that he wanted to show the team, hey, you guys were, you know, you're reading your own press. Everyone's all, you know, hyper on you guys right now. We have a lot of work to do. And, uh, but yeah, watching him come out like that this morning. I, you know, somebody had said if a lesser coach had showed up for a press conference like that, the press would be ripping him. And I, I firmly believe that's true. So do you think that Bill Belichick, with all his one line brief answers, I might say, a la John Tortorella of the Columbus Blue Jackets. Okay. Oh, my. Yeah. Now he's, he's good at those two, as I hear. Okay. You think he's mellowing a little bit, showing a little bit of a sense of humor for a guy that's actually doing a Subway commercial? Yeah. 
I think um, I think Belichick likes the uh, the virtual press conferences. I, I mentioned to a couple of friends of mine that it seems like he smiled more this year in training camp than he probably has in years. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think he likes not having anybody there, although he still does the silent treatment. One of the guys asked him about why they didn't call a timeout in the Seattle game. And he gave him 15 seconds of dead silence. Really? And then, because the guy, uh, well, did you guys think about calling a timeout there? And he did the whole thing where he makes that sound with his mouth. And he just stared at the screen for 15 seconds and go, yeah. <laughs> Master of the mind games, is that correct? <laughs> yeah, it's always funny. But, yeah, he, he looked like he had been on a bender uh, this morning. And I think that was on purpose. I think that was for the team's benefit, you know, uh, show that, hey, you know, everyone's pumping your tires right now. We have a long way to go. You don't win that many Super Bowls without that mentality, though, either. Yeah, and the, the one thing he's been able to do is relate to players because a lot of guys, they're really good coaches, and then they kind of lose that locker room where they can't relate anymore to these players. And I think he's been able to do that. Yeah, I mean, the key nowadays. And I think, actually, I hate to say they hate that house money, but knowing that Brady is gone and you bring in Cam Newton, now I think that he's on a mission to prove that he could go out there and win without Tom Brady. Oh, yeah. I think that's been a big thing with him. I think it's a big thing with Brady, too, this year. Right. You know, they've been hearing this, oh, well, they can't win without each other. And I think both of them want to show that they can. So it'll be interesting to see how it all plays out. All right, just so you know, folks, this is the Sports Exchange. My name is Scott Morgan Ruth, and he's Steve Ballesteri across from me. Glad to have him with us as we do our weekly football synopsis here. Let you know what we think about the past, the present, and the future. We do this every week. And you know what? Nothing like having a guy alongside of me that I could sit here and relate to and on many different levels. So, Steve, with that said, okay, as we wind down the broadcast, why don't you let everybody know who you represent, and we'll wrap up the broadcast after that. Sure sure thing. And once again, thanks for inviting me. I always look forward to these Wednesday night talks. I love talking football, and I love talking football with you. So Thank you. Um, it's, this is a lot of fun. But you can follow me on Twitter, at SteveB7SFG. I'm also on Instagram, although I don't post much on there. Um, I don't either. <laughs> yeah, I, I've been, uh, my boss is after me to put more stuff on Instagram, but I, I just, uh, that's something I haven't been doing. So I guess I've been lax in that. I should do more of it. But uh, I write for PatsFans.com. I also uh, do a podcast called Patriots 4th and 2 uh, with my co-hosts up in New England. And... I write for a military magazine, as we've talked about in the past, uh, called softrep.com. I cover uh, a lot of current events with the special operations community. So, Very good. And, and if you want to listen to the audio version of the Sports Exchange uh, with myself and Steve Ballester, you can do so the following ways. You can do so through Apple Podcasts, Spreaker, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Google Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Let me repeat that back again. Uh, Apple Podcasts, Spreaker, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Google Podcasts, wherever you get your podcasts. Now, if you want to get a hold of us, you can uh, follow me at, at Tribune South. That's the at Tribune South. Facebook and Instagram, South Florida Tribune. You can follow us there. I don't do a lot on Instagram. I know it's for a lot of the younger kids. Uh, I know it's primarily for photos. I suppose I could probably do it a little bit more. And I do from time to time when I have a lot of my nice sports photos, but... This type of thing, I don't know how well it blends. Not to say it won't, but I have other preferences for which to promote. And Instagram is fourth in my lineup. Okay. Now, you're also watching this broadcast via our, the South Florida Tribune YouTube channel. We encourage everybody, if you want to follow my shows with Steve and all the rest of everybody else, you can subscribe to the South Florida Tribune YouTube channel, and you'll get every one of our broadcasts. The man by the pool and the man with the memorabilia, and we still are able to convey the same message. So let's 
So please subscribe to the South Florida Tribune YouTube channel. Our website is www.southfloridatribune.com. You'll find the broadcast on there as well as the content from our media distribution partners as well as our columnists. And we've also bought the rights to the Motor City Monitor. So for some of our Detroit followers in Michigan, for, which is where I'm based out of originally, we do that. So you'll be able to find some copy from time to time. I love sharing this information with Steve. Hopefully it helps him out a little bit as well to try to come up with the most in-depth information that he can, but it's there to pass on. And I'm glad that I'm able to get that on to you as often as I can, Steve. Our email address is Tribune at gmail.com. And you can also find me on LinkedIn, Scott Morgan Rob. So meanwhile, Steve, as always, I enjoy these Wednesday conversations with you as well. They're a lot of fun. And, you know, just during COVID-19, I guess we both say that we ask everybody to please mask up, show common sense, show common courtesy, and be safe, stay at home, and be healthy. Because you know what? We see that COVID-19 is turning this world upside down, and it doesn't look like it's getting any easier. And at least the one thing that we can say is we're making the best of this virtual situation. I'm enjoying it. I'm embracing it. But I don't embrace the fact that over 200,000 people have passed away due to this virus. So any closing thoughts, Steve? No, uh, just, uh, I just wanted to, once again, thank you for having me. Uh, and to reiterate what you just said, you know, take care of yourselves, take care of each other. Um, you know, th we're going through a weird year this year in 2020, but we're almost through it. And um, with a, a little luck and the grace of the big guy upstairs, Hopefully we'll all be here next year and 2021 will be a lot better. Well, I can't wait to get across the state and have those cheese curds over at Culver, Steve. You can rest assured. But meanwhile, I'm, I'm glad to be able to do this with you every Wednesday. So once again, on behalf of Steve Ballesteri, my name is Scott Morgan, Roth, the Motor City Mad Bell. Thank you for joining us on this edition of the Sports Exchange. And as Tony Kornheiser would say, we'll see if we can do it better next week. Uh, once again, this is Steve. This is Steve. This is Scott. Have a good night. Enjoy week three of the National Football League. And I'm looking forward to getting critique with some of my scores with the big guy on, in southwest Florida. Thank you very much for joining us, everybody. And good night.